So, carbohydrates, the last piece of our puzzle here. We've got a strong foundation on enzymes and enzyme kinetics and how enzymes work. We've talked about redox reactions for pulling energy off of molecules in the form of transferred electrons. And we're going to be metabolizing glucose starting in our next lecture. So we need to have an understanding of sugars in general. I guess glucose a little bit specifically, but more so the general chemistry and general structure of sugars. And that's what this lecture series is all about. Three chunks to this lecture, so this will be lecture 10A, 10B, and 10C, chapter 16 from our textbook. And in this chunk, we will start off just talking about the structure and chemical characteristics of different sugars in general to give us a strong foundation in carbohydrates. And we'll also talk about more complex carbohydrates, such as disaccharides, oligosaccharides, and polysaccharides. As we move on to the second and third chunks of this lecture series, we'll begin talking about chemistry that involves sugars, monosaccharides. We will talk about glycogen as a sugar storage form for animals, and starch as a sugar storage form for plants, and cellulose as a cell wall for plant cells. And we'll touch briefly on bacterial cell walls as well. And then we'll begin wrapping up the material by talking about what happens when we pop sugars onto proteins and make a very complex molecule called a glycoprotein and how glycoproteins interact with lectins for extremely important biological processes. So before we go any further, let's appreciate for a moment that carbohydrates are one of only four major important classes of biomolecules. The other three classes are lipids, proteins, and the nucleic acids, DNA and RNA. Really, that's it. If you think about a living life form, you can distill everything inside of that cell or that life form down into one of these four categories. So carbohydrates play a huge role in making life possible. Carbohydrates are also the most abundant organic matter on Earth. If you were to separate all of the different classes of organic mo molecules and compounds on our planet, carbohydrates would by far weigh the most. And they do so many different things. Carbohydrates for us primarily is a fuel source. We make ATP from the energy that we extract from carbohydrates. And we also store energy for at least short term through making complex carbohydrates as well. But let's not lose sight of the fact that the very backbone of DNA and RNA wouldn't be possible without carbohydrates. Remember that phospho phosphate sugar backbone? Well, that sugar is ribose, hence ribonucleic acid. And that ribose sugar plays a huge role in the integrity of our nucleic acids. Cellulose is nothing more than a complex carbohydrate of, glu of glucose monomers. So the entire structural support of every plant cell in our world is due to sugar. And believe it or not, sugars also play a role in transmitting information around in the cell. Uh, if you take cell and molecular biology here at Baypath, you'll see that glycoproteins are the primary uh, message conduit for our cells. Most messages are sent through some type of sugar tree. And so um, sugars are playing a huge role in cell-cell signaling. Cells interact with other cells, largely through recognizing the sugars that they display. So we can see and appreciate all of the things about life that carbohydrates make possible. And so to do that, we need a diversity of these molecules. We need a way to make these molecules of different shapes and sizes so that they can do these different jobs. And that bling brings us to the idea of complex carbohydrates. Complex carbohydrates are nothing more than chains of individual sugar monomers brought together to make larger structures of sugars linked together. Individual sugar monomers are called monosaccharides. Saccharide meaning sugar, and mono, of course, meaning one. And so if we start linking a small number of sugars together, we can create an oligosaccharide. If we continue adding sugars to that, and we have many, many sugar monomers linked together into a very large structure, we have made a polysaccharide, or a complex carbohydrate. There are different types of monosaccharides, different types of sugars, and each type has its own property and its own chemistry, and also each type can usually take on its own shape, its own three-dimensional conformation. And so we can appreciate a very large amount of diversity that we find in this sugar family because of the different types of monomers we have, the different ways we can link them together, and the different shapes they can take. So monosaccharides, the simplest of the carbohydrates, the single subunits that we use to build larger chains of saccharides. If you think about the word carbohydrate, right there we're getting information about this important molecule. Carbohydrate is meant to really symbolize hydrated carbon. The foundational chemical formula for any sugar 
is one carbon, two hydrogens, and one oxygen linked together an n number of times. This is the basic repeating pattern of carbohydrates. If you think of it as a carbohydrate, you see that sugars are really nothing more than individually hydrated carbons, which is pretty crazy. Again, these carbohydrates include the most easily used fuel source we have on this planet, glucose, a key component of DNA and RNA, ribose, and so many things in between. The smallest and simplest of the monosaccharides are three carbon sugars, which we call trioses, os for being a sugar constituent and tri for being three carbons in that sugar. Here are some examples of those. We see dihydroxyacetone, uh, but also glyceraldehyde, which you may have heard of in other classes. And you can see, due to chirality in these sugars, we have different forms or isomers of glyceraldehyde designated just as we do for amino acids, L and D form. If trioses are three carbon sugars, we can also have four, five, six, and seven carbon sugars, and they would be called tetroses, pentoses, hexoses, and heptoses, telling us the number of carbons we have in those sugars. And as I've already said, whenever chirality is present in the sugar molecule, we have enantiomers, we have isoforms, designated L and D. So we can break simple sugars, monosaccharides, up into two different chemical classes, ketoses and aldoses. The differences are subtle, I'll point them out in the next slides, but I wouldn't stress the differences too much for this class. It's not something I would ask for specifically in the future. So these are the aldoses. The aldoses are characterized as the carbon-1 being a carbonyl carbon holding onto a proton. That's what makes it an aldose. And if we look at these, we see that we have trioses, tetroses, pentoses, and hexoses. Three, four, five, and six carbon sugars, respectively. There's glyceraldehyde, kind of the mother sugar to this class. We also see ribose here, a five carbon sugar the component of the backbone of DNA and RNA. Glucose belongs to the aldoses, our primary sugar component. And you may have heard of mannose and galactose in other classes as well. They also belong to this family. The ketoses also feature a carbonyl carbon, uh, but that's on their second carbon because that carbonyl carbon is linked to an alcohol group that we see here. That's what makes the ketoses different. The carbonyl carbon is carbon number two. We see dihydroxyacetone, as we saw in the previous slide, but more relevant to our day-to-day -day experience. Fructose is a member of the ketoses, fructose of high fructose corn syrup, uh, a sugar that we commonly find in our foods. So six carbon sugars from either class, both the ketoses and the aldoses, are the most naturally occurring, the most common, and it's what we tend to encounter the most in metabolism. The predominant form of these monosaccharides, especially the longer ones, the uh, pentoses and hexoses is not an open chain as we saw in the previous slides but instead a ring structure. These cyclized rings of sugars tend to be a little bit more energetically favorable. They have a lower free energy so the universe likes them better and they can spontaneously form. For glucose the way that we get this sugar is that the C1 carbon, the first carbon, the aldehyde carbon in the sugar is actually attacked by the hydroxyl group on C5, carbon 5 and that forms an intramolecular bond. It forms a bond within the molecule itself. So we can see that diagrammed out here. Here's carbon-5 with its hydroxyl group, and the oxygen of this hydroxyl group is actually going to launch a nucleophilic attack on carbon-1. It's like the molecule attacking itself. That nucleophilic attack is going to cause a bond to be made with carbon-1, giving us the cyclized sugar, giving us the ring in this sugar here. Because we have a six-membered ring, essentially we form a hexagon here, we call this structure a pyranose ring to symbolize that it is a six-membered ring. For fructose, we can consider what happens when fructose does a similar type of reaction. Here, it's the second carbon that's attacked instead of the first. And the second carbon can be attacked either by C5 or C6. Both of those have hydroxyl groups. If the C5 hydroxyl attacks the uh, second carbon of fructose, we're going to get a five-membered ring. If the sixth carbon is the one that does the attacking, then we get a six-membered ring, a pyranose ring. Let's take a closer look, though, at that five-carbon attack. So here we're saying that this hydroxyl group, as opposed to this one, this hydroxyl group launches a nucleophilic attack on the carbonyl carbon. Here the carbonyl carbon is carbon number two. 
Because of that, this is going to result in two carbons being out of the plane of the ring, and the ring itself becomes a pentagon. It's a five-membered ring. We call a ring like this a furanos ring to distinguish it from the six-membered pyranos ring. Only four carbons lie in the plane of the ring. Now, the fifth vertice is, of course, held together by that oxygen. So again, fructose can do this. Ribose obviously does this as well, because this is the structure that the ribose sugar takes in the backbone of DNA and RNA. So let's consider six-membered rings first, the pyranos rings. They're not planar. They don't exist in two dimensions. They take a three-dimensional conformation. And in fact, they have two different possible three-dimensional conformations that they can take. This is material that you've probably had before, and perhaps for some of you, this brings up bad memories. We can have the chair or the boat conformation. The chair conformation kind of looks like a lounge chair. You would be sitting with your back here. Your legs go up comfortably and then rest on this foot over here. The boat conformation looks like a very primitive paper boat where the center is uh, flat and the ends come up on both sides. So you may know from other classes which one is more favorable. Looking at it, you may be able to tell as well. It's the chair conformation that's the more favorable conformation. And the reason for that is because in both of these forms, we have what we refer to as axial and equatorial bonds. The axial bonds are largely perpendicular to the conformation itself, and they go up or down. The equatorial bonds are parallel to the general shape of the conformation, and they point outward, away from the ring. If the groups on the axial bonds, if those axial groups are large groups, they will clash with one another. They will sterically interfere with each other, making it a very un uh, unfavorable conformation. However, if the large groups, the large bulky groups, are equatorial, they'll have plenty of room to spread out. Equatorial groups have more room, and so they're less crowded. If you look closely at the chair form here, you'll see that all of the axial groups are the smallest groups we can have, single protons. And since those groups are so small, they're not crowded, there's no steric interference, and that's what makes the chair form favored. Some of the axial groups in the boat form are not protons. We see uh, some hydroxyl groups are there, and that leads to some steric interference and a less favorable conformation. That's for the six-membered pyranose rings. Furanos rings behave differently. They, too, are not planar, but because they are a five-membered ring, instead of taking a boat or chair form, they actually pucker. The puckering is when one of those carbons lies out of the plane of the other four, and this is actually referred to as envelope form. Because if you think of this as the letter-holding part of the envelope, this rectangle, then this is the flap of the envelope that you lick and seal shut. So it's a, a good name for the conformation. It describes very fittingly what it looks like. Different carbons can be out of the plane. Different carbons can be that fifth jutting puckered carbon, depending on the conformation. And the name of the conformation tells you which carbon is the puckered carbon. So here we see that this is the C3 endo form. That means that the carbon at this vertice is actually the third carbon in the ring. If we look at C2 endo, we see that now it's the next carbon over that is at the tip of that envelope flap, and the other four carbons are in one single two-dimensional plane themselves. So the name tells you which is the puckered carbon. It gives you some idea of the conformation. A little bit about the chemistry of these monosaccharides. Monosaccharides can interact with a large variety of different molecules. They can interact with alcohols or amines, larger molecules that contain amine groups. And whenever they do make bonds, whenever monosaccharides do make bonds with alcohols or amines, they have created what is called a glycosidic bond, and they are a glycoside. In fact, for those of you who have had molecular biology, you may remember that the bond that holds the ribose sugar to the nitrogenous base is referred to as the glycosidic bond. And the reason why this is a glycosidic bond is because it is a bond with a monosaccharide carbon and an amine group on the nitrogenous base. So nucleosides are essentially combinations of ribose sugars, of five-membered ring furanose sugars, and amine groups as part of the larger nitrogenous base. In fact, the only reason this is a nucleoside and not a nucleotide is because we don't have our three phosphates coming off here. So these modified forms of sugars, these sugars that are holding on to other things, can have a great 
variety and diversity of different chemistries. They can have different reactivities with different molecules. And of course, we're increasing the diversity of carbohydrates because we can link them to all of these different groups. So to summarize this first uh, chunk of the lecture here, we really just wanted to introduce you to sugars in general, get everybody caught up and on the same page. And so we started off talking about different types of monosaccharides, the ketoses and the aldoses and what makes them different. Then we went on to say that, well, most sugars are not linear. Instead, they cyclize. And when they cyclize, we have different conformations. If it's a Pyrrhonose six-membered ring, we can have the chair or boat conformations. And if it's a five-membered Furanose ring, we can have an endo, a puck ring, in the envelope form. So as we move on from here, we're going to talk a little about the interesting things that sugars can do from a biochemical perspective. But until then, thanks so much for watching.